if you travel close to the speed of light, so if you had a spacecraft traveling close to the speed of light, then distances shrink from your perspective. So, and the one number I always have in my mind is that the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the protons go around the ring, which is 27 kilometers in circumference, and they go around at 99.999999% the speed of light. So close to the speed of light. At that speed, distances shrink by a factor of 7,000. And so that ring is something like four meters Whoa. in diameter uh, to, to, the, to the protons. Whoa. So, so it, according to laws of physics, if you can build a spacecraft that goes very close to the speed of light, you can shrink the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and therefore the time it takes to get there by a, an, arbitrary, an arbitrary amount, actually. The closer you get to the speed of light, the more you can shrink it. And so you can make those two million light years you could traverse across that distance in principle in a minute, according to physics. However, the downside is that you, you couldn't come back to tell, if you came back to the Earth at that speed to tell everybody what you'd found, at least four million years would have passed on the Earth. Oh boy! So, so you can't. <laughs> so, there's kind of a downside to it that you, you, we could, in principle, explore the galaxy and beyond. But getting to chat to everybody about what you found is forbidden wow. <laughs> by the structure of the universe. It's just the way a, that relativity works. That really is essentially a time machine. Well, it, it's a time machine in the sense that we could go arbitrarily far into the future by flying around in a rocket very close to the speed of light. So we could come back a, a million years in the future and, and look at the Earth and find out what had happened. You can't go back as far as we can tell. So you can't get back to your, you can't build a time machine to go backwards. So these are time machines. The, the, the world is built such that a time machine, a way to think about it, the way that we teach it in, in undergraduate physics is that, so in Einstein's theory, there are events, which are things that happen in space time. So that would be an event. It's something that happens. Our conversation now is a thing that happens, space time. And what Einstein's theory tells you is it's about the relationship between events. So, so let's say that we wanted to come back here tomorrow. That would be another event. We meet again tomorrow. And you can say how much time has passed between those events. In Einstein's theory, the amount of time that has passed is the length of the path you take over space-time between the events. So it's just like saying... In a, in a sense, what's the distance between Austin and Dallas, right? And you'd say, okay, well, it depends what route you go. Well, what's interesting in Einstein's theory, the only complication is the length of the path you take between events is the time measured by a clock that's carried along that path. So that's, that's how much. So if you're the carrying your watch with you and you go between here and tomorrow, <laughs> you go this way, you go off and maybe you fly to Dallas and back or something and then come back again. There's a particular length. Someone else can take a different path, obviously. And so that a different amount of time will pass for them between those two things that happen. Just because of that one fact. A very we, infinitely small but measurable amount of time. It's a tiny amount unless you travel, someone goes close to the speed of light or someone goes near a black hole or something where the, where the space time is all distorted. That, that, then you can get big effects, but it's still completely measurable. I mean, they, they are quite big effects, these, in the sense that for the satellite navigation system, for example, GPS, um, the, the clocks on the satellites tick at a different rate to the clocks on the ground. And it's a, a quite a big effect. I think from memory, it's something like 30, over 30,000 nanoseconds per day difference mm. because of they're, in, they're in a weaker gravitational field and they're moving and all sorts of things. It's the same thing. But 30,000 nanoseconds, light travels one foot per nanosecond, which is great. I always say that God used imperial units because it's, <laughs> it's 30.8 cents of it. It's one foot, right? It's good. It's one foot per nanosecond. So that's 30,000 feet of position measurement if you drift your clock out by 30,000 nanoseconds. Mm. So it wouldn't work. So, so it's a big effect for when you start using time to measure distance, which is what we do in satellite navigation, GPS. So we have to correct. So the clocks have to be corrected 
for that effect. So, so it's an effect that we can easily measure with atomic clocks, but it doesn't make much difference to us as humans. Right. But uh, just the, the point is that the laws of nature would allow you to do it if you could go close to speed of light. The, by the way, the last thing I'll say is the, the limiting factor. You might say, well, what happens if you go really close to the speed of light? What happens if you go at the speed of light? Well, special relativity, Einstein's theory, is built such that uh, the, the distance between any two events in the universe along the path of a beam of light between the events is zero. No time at all. So, so that's the way that Einstein's theory is built. So he asked the question when he was younger, famously, what would the universe look like if I traveled alongside a beam of light? And the answer is that you wouldn't perceive any time.